Hi, uh, my name is Ana Verissimo. I am a certified professional dog trainer and currently the behavior manager at Tony La Russa's Animal Rescue Foundation in Walnut Creek, California. Happy to be here with you today. My goal would be to share with you some recommendations in how to raise or how to have a behaviorally healthy dog. The first thing I like to start with is aim to have a consistent routine. Uh, what's a routine? A routine is to give a specific time to events that happens in the life of your dog during the day, the time they wake up, the time they eat, the time they go for, for a walk. Why is a routine, a consistent routine uh, important? Well, Dogs, they don't have control over their life. They don't know what they're going to eat, who they're going to eat, what they're going to do. And having them with a consistent routine gives the sense of control, and that helps build their confidence and also decreases stress. One of the things that I like to emphasize on routines is the time when you feed your dog. Uh, here um, at ARF, we have private consultations under the questionnaire. They have to talk about their routine. And one thing that I see very often is that pet parents, they say that they feed their dogs and then take them for a walk or feed their dogs and play with them in the, in, in the backyard. So it's very important for you to take your dog for a walk or play with the dog when they are hungry. Why? Because you want them to be motivated to do what you wanted them to do and how you do that by having a delicious treat and an empty stomach, right? If they are food, food, they might not be as motivated as you wish. So you're going to go for a walk or you're going to play in the backyard is an opportunity for you to, to train, to teach your dog to uh, do a recall or even at the end of the leash when you go for a walk, if you want to have a long leash as well, practice basic matters, sits and downs. He's going to be motivated because he wants food. He's a primary enforcer, right? That's something that they love to have. Another thing that happens, especially when you go for a walk, is to build positive associations with the world around them. And we do that by using counter and conditioning. What is that? It's associating something with something delicious. So if your dog goes outside and he sees a car, oh, that's a car, and he gets a hot dog. He sees a person, oh, that's a nice person, he gets a hot dog. Oh, he saw, you know, something happened and he got startled, you get a hot dog. He starts building positive association. He has a positive emotional response to the world around them. So that's why it's important. Every time you take a dog for a walk, he has an empty stomach and you have treats to give it to them for that reason. Uh, one other thing that I like to, to talk about is that they don't understand words, right? We do have to create a way to communicate with a, with a different species. We humans like words, we communicate with words. So we need to build a communication with them. How do we do that? We associate an event with a word. So I do recommend doing that with everything that happens in the life of your dog. Say, are you thirsty? Do you want water? Or are you going to go water? Do you want to go for a walk? Walk, then you're going to go outside, right? So they start learning what it is that's going to happen after you said that word. And they are able to communicate with you what they want to do once they do that. Um, another thing that is also um, very important is to provide dogs an opportunity to express natural behavior. So for example, cats, they lick, dogs, they chew. So you have, you know, dogs like to chew different things and they chew things in different ways. One, the, one of the type of chewing that dogs do is with their molar. You know, they go and they put something in the molar, which is a cross bite, and they go, nyah, nyah, nyah. and that's something that's important for them to do. So we need to provide opportunities for them to do that. And, and, and products that you can use to do that, you know, are pulley sticks or no high toys that you can find at the Pet Food Express is a, one of my favorite uh, products for the dogs and you providing them to do that and what happened is that once a dog have a chance to express natural behavior they feel relaxed they feel good because you have provided them that and uh, it's very important to be able to provide that that that, uh, that opportunity to express this behavior for them to calm down and feel like a, you know a happy dog um one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and again, it's something that everyone says to me, oh, I know about this product already, is the comb. Okay, why do I want to talk about this product? Because um, this can be a very, very powerful tool to manage, to prevent, and even modify behavior if you build this product to be it for you. And I'm going to explain to you how. So, and one of the other things that when I recommend is the first thing I hear, oh, my dog is allergic to peanut butter. My dog never liked the cone. So there is a process for you to help your dog 
going uh, to love this product for you to be able to, to use it. First thing that you need to understand, there are different sizes from five pounds all, all, all over, uh, all up to 85 uh, pounds and more. And there are different kinds of rubbers. So we have um, rubbers for moderate chewers, for, for extreme chewers, for puppies, and, and for senior dogs. So and it's important to understand the difference here because the puppy rubber is soft, right? And it's soft for a reason. Puppies, they don't have the strength to bite on something very hard. And they actually have very sharp teeth. So when they bite on it, it doesn't hurt their teeth. One thing that happens with pet parents that have dogs that are like mid to large size is that instead of getting the puppy one, they go ahead and they get, you know, the, the, the red ones for adult dogs. And what happens here is that they, they, they might play and eat from the comb, but they're going to eat everybody's shoes because they are not able to, to bite on that one. They need to be able to bite down on a softer rubber. And the same, you know, for, for senior dogs is the same. It's, it's softer because they don't have the strength in their teeth, right? They might have issues with their teeth and it's softer for them to be able to bite. So it's very important to understand, you know, the type of the temperament, uh, the chewing temperament of your dog. If he has a gentle chewers, what gentle chewers means? Dogs that can have plush toys and they don't, they never destroy. They carry them around, they might lick on them, but they never destroy them. Um, moderate chewers, they might destroy plush toys, fabric toys, but they do well with that, with the classic rubber. And uh, well, for the black ones, um, it's dogs that really are powerful chewers. It's very chewers. And that's very funny because it, um, pet parents would call me and say, Anna, help me. My dog is destroying my house. And I always say, okay, what is he destroying? And he said, well, he ate my shoes, everybody, you know, the kids' toys, and, you know, the, the books. It's a red one. Right? If he says to me, oh, he ate the baseboard, you know, the feet on the table, you know, the vacuum cleaner, that's when you go to a black one. So you have to understand because if you give a dog that's a mother chewer a black one, they're unable to bite on it because they don't, they don't have the strength to bite on it. They're not going to be interested. So the first thing to understand is what rubber for based on the temperament, the chewing temperament of a dog uh, to choose it. And then the size because it's important for them to be able to do a second type of chewing. Remember I talked about the chewing with the molar that they do with the bully stick and all right, they, they, they do a cross bite. That's an important one to satisfy. The second one is when they do a full bite over the comb and they go, gotcha, gotcha. they put it in their mouth and they bite on it. And dogs like to do that as well. So it's important that fits in their mouth. So they're doing that, and especially when they're taking the food out, they also help them to press it down for the food, the food to come out um, easier, okay? Um, and another thing is that um, a lot of people give up when they give a comb. Some people even freeze the comb and they give it to the dog. They had never seen a comb before. So it's very important to go to the process of teaching the dog how to eat from a comb. So you start with dry food, the kibble you put inside and you offer to the dog. So they're going to nose it around, they're going to paw it, the food's going to come out and they're like, oh, the food comes out from here. Yes, he got it. Now you can mix the kibble, which is something dry, with something wet. It can be yogurt, it can be banana, mashed banana, it can be canned pumpkin, something that your dog, their dog loves, right? It has to be something that they like. Then you make that mixture you put inside. You don't have to pack, pack very, very hard. And then it has to leak now to take. So you increase the challenge so that they get motivated to do it. And then you say, oh, I do that. I mix something wet, you know, with the, with the kibble, and I give to my dog, and then, you know, with 15 minutes, he's done. Freeze it. Now you can start freezing, and that's gonna take your dog up to one hour to leak to take the food out. And that's the good part, because what you understand is that when the dog goes to the process of leaking to take the food out of comb, makes them feel good, because again, it's satisfying a natural need to work for the food. Second thing, licking is soothing for them. They feel relaxed. They release endorphins when they go through the process of licking. So that's what's important. So one other thing that I recommend, and it's going to help with managing um, and, um, and um, with uh, behave, managing behavior or, or uh, modifying behavior, is to create a routine with the comb. Every time your dog's going to have a comb, he goes down on a mat and you give the comb. So he gets up and said, okay, you don't want your comb? I do, do, okay. Then you're gonna go to a new mat and you're gonna lie down. Teach your dog that every time he gets a, a, a comb, he needs to be lying down on his mat. Why is that? Because once you build this routine, 
he learns that this is a place where I feel safe, I feel comfortable, and I have something delicious. He helps you with that training a dog for a crate training. He helps your dog to learn, you know, be able to go with you for a coffee shop and be selling down next to you when you have your coffee or you have your lunch. So building this routine, even when you go to the vet, you can take them, take your little mat, and give it to them, and they feel happy, and they can check their ears, they can clip their, their nails by doing that. So that's a routine that you can do. That's how powerful the comb can be. But again, you need to, to make them feel that uh, going through this process, you really want to do it. So how do you know your dog, you know, it's, um, it has this positive emotional response that we thought when you get a comb? I compare that to when you take a dog for a walk right there are two things that happen you pick up the leash he goes we're gonna go for a walk what's the second thing that happened oh we're gonna go for a walk right so it's gonna be the same thing you pick up the mat you're gonna, oh i'm gonna get my comb what's the second thing yeah i'm gonna get a comb okay you got him so now you know you have this positive emotional response he really wants your comb now he can tangle for you if you want okay so it's very important to do that um one other thing to understand is that you know dogs and um Anymore in general, they they learn, um, they are born with a desire to work for food. So they prefer to work for their food than getting the same food for free, right? So that's why it's important. When I also talk to, to pet parents, I mean, adopters here about, you know, their routine and what they're doing, I ask them, um, you know, how, um, how they, they feed their dog. And so, oh, yeah, I feed them in a bowl. And I was like, okay, so... What do you gain with that? You're not getting much with that when you're feeding your dog in a bowl, right? Because the food is there, they go and they eat it and it's all done, right? So it's very important to provide them so another opportunity to satisfy a natural need. So I do recommend and I do have home products here because I do, I think they're very, very, very well made, very high quality. It's a wobbler for this is one of the products that we use here in the shelter as well. So this is an easy one. You you screw, you put the food of the dog here, you know, and you close it. And now, you know, the dog has to, to paw it, he needs to nose it, right? He needs to work with the food. The other thing that's happening here is that they have control of their food as well. And we talk about that, right? When the dogs have control over their food, they feel good. That builds their confidence. And so that's very important. Also, you give them mental stimulation. You give them something to do, they're tired because they have to work on that to take their food, that food out, and they feel happy about doing it. Um, one of the challenges that I find, especially with adult um, dogs, you know, dogs that are adopted, because what happens is that when you have a puppy, then you're more like engaging with the puppy. Let me show you how to do this. Let me show you how you, you know, you, you chew from a stick. Let me, let me show you how to, to, to work with a comb. With any toy, even adult dogs, it's very important that they learn how to do this. So on a, on a, on a, comb, on a product like this or, or a ball that they, they have to roll to take the food out, I say, put something, you know, interesting there. Put their kibble, but maybe add a hot dog or something that smells really good to entice them to do it. Help them learn to do this. Not just because you know he's an adult dog, put the food, give it to the dog, you figure it out. You know, they might not be interested. Engage with your dog when you're doing that so that he can have, you know, entice him and be motivated to take the, the, the food out of this. Other things that I like to talk about as well is engaging with your dogs with play. Um, you know, some of the toys, the products that, that Kong has, for example, Hugo, I love this toy, this toy because you can move it like this and the dogs really love to go, you know, after that and have a squeaker on it, most of them, and then they love to, to, to go after that. And I say, I love a game of tag because tag you can play with your dog in a very small space, right? You engage with your dog, you bond with them, you can play a little, you know, fetch for them to go and they come back and engage with your dog again. It's very important. This is what you know builds their confidence. I say that we do a lot of things for um, for our dogs. We we take care of them. We select the good food. We take them to the vet, and those are good things. And I'm sure that they appreciate us for doing that. But are the things that you do with your dog that bond, you know, creates this bond and the love that we have for them. So I do recommend interactive play uh, with your dog. As, as much as you can or as little as you can when you before you go to work or uh, when you come home engage with them you know show your love uh, with your dog it's very funny because I remember that my dog Kali she loves a ball and uh, and I left her in a hotel once and I said you know these are the balls and I brought four dolls you know these are the favorite balls that she has she loves to play with them 
And they said, no problem. We're going to try now to do our best for her to do that. She never played with the box. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, she didn't like to be there, right? She was not happy. When I came to get her, the first thing she did, she went for the ball. Because it's not just about the ball, right? It's about me and how much I love playing ball with her. Um, one um, important thing that I want to mention as well is a long time. Especially because now, and then we we all talking about you know the, the changes in our lives with COVID and the the fact that we spend more time with our dogs at home, and now we are going back to work. We are changing our routine. Uh, it's very important that your dog feels comfortable about not having you there with them. So a long time when you are still at home is also very important. So um, what I recommend is. You have built the routine. Remember, we talk about the routine. That's when the routine is powerful. Now you can use this routine to teach your dog that I'm going to be here working and you're going to be over there. And you can start just right over there in the corner, the same room that you are. You're going to be by yourself. And then he's eating from a cone. Next day, you can put him the, you know, the, the, the room next to the room that you have, door open, and you put him there and said, that's what you're going to be while I'm working here. If the dogs get the cone, comes back to you, you know, with the cone in their mouth, you know, you say, oh, you don't want that? Okay, I'll keep it. Said, no, I want it. Oh, okay, then let's go back there. Then you go back to the same space and you give it to him. And it's going to happen again, and you do it again. And you bring them back there. And they learn, okay, for me to finish my delicious con, I have to be there. Remember, delicious, right? And he's right there. You're not very far from it. And then you start increasing the distance, or you can start closing the door. Just get them used to do that. Another thing that you can do is short intervals of exiting the house. So you can go outside for a few seconds and come immediately back, say, oh, I forgot my glasses. I don't know. You go you know, to the kitchen, go to the room, and then come back and then work a little bit more, get up and then go in again. Or I forgot my purse. You know, don't talk to your dog. Just get him desensitized, used to you moving out of the door and come back to the door. Oh, she's coming back. So that he gets a costume from you, you know, leaving when he's enjoying something good. So you have to provide him with something that is entertaining, that makes him feel happy. Remember the routine? Remember the routine with Kong? So they are comfortable in their space, eating something good when you move around, when you exit the house and leave them alone and come back. And that's going to help them, you know, build um, a resilience to you not being there. And that's what you wanted to do. And you wanted to do this... Um, in, in gradually. You don't just want to give the comb to the dog and go for an hour, right? If you are used to being in the home with your dog, just to do this gradually so that he gets used to it not to be there. So again, you can do that even when you're home, right? A long time at home um, with your dog. Um, another thing that I wanted to, to mention to you is um, how dogs learn. Right, because we talk about association, right? Right at the beginning of this talk, I said when you take a dog for a walk and he experiences the world, it's very important for you to associate something with something delicious, right? And that's when it's positive, or that's when it's good. If he sees a new person, he gets something delicious. He sees a car passing by, he gets something delicious. He sees a dog, he gets something delicious. So they learn by association. They also learn by consequences. And so, how does it work? Well. If I do something and something good happens to me, the consequence is positive, I'm going to keep doing, right? If it's not positive, if I don't like, that behavior tends to disappear, to stop from happening. For example, um, you have the dog outside in the backyard, you know, the door is closed, you're watching this, the, the left chapter of your favorite show. So it's like, they, oh, I want to watch it. They start barking, whoa, 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 whoa. And you're like, oh, I really want to watch this. Oh, let him in. And then you let the dog in. What have the dog learned? If I bark, they let me in. So now your dog is going to bark every time they want to come in because they know by doing that, you're going to open the door. So whatever it is that, that happens after a behavior that they do, they learn to do that more. So, for example, um, one big thing that everybody says, and it happens to us every week here at our puppy socials. We have puppy socials that are offered on, um, every week on Wednesday and Sundays. And they come with little puppies, right? And what do they do to everybody? They jump on them. And what's the reaction of the pet parents and most, most uh, uh, adopters do here? They jump on you and you say, you know, or you push them down. Some people say no or say off, right? So what do you think is happening here? So the dog jumps on you and you look at the dog, you push the dog down or you say no or say off. So 
is the consequences to what he's doing. Something that's going to increase the behavior or decrease the behavior. Increase, right? Because he's jumping on you. What he wants is your attention, and you give it to them. You're looking at them, or you either touch them, right? Even off is already too late. He's already on you, right? As he stops, he's jumping on you. You say off. It's like saying potato. Doesn't matter. You're talking to the dog. So if your dog jumps on you, the best thing to do is to turn your back around. Turn away so that you don't have any attention. You want my attention? You don't have my attention if you do that. But if you sit and they sit, then you get my attention. Now he learns, oh, if I sit, I get a treat instead of jumping. If you jump, turn around. If I sit, I get a treat. And for very jumpy dogs, what I like to recommend is that I praise the seat, good seat, good dog. Then I pay, I give a treat for the down. Why is that? Because from a seat position, you can jump, right? From a down position, it's just harder for them to be able to, to jump. So I do recommend if you have a jumpy dog, first thing, teach seats, teach down. Then you start praising the seats and then, you know, giving a treat uh, on the down to reinforce their behavior because that becomes the default behavior for them to do instead of jumping um, on people. And um, I think this is going to be, you know, um, last but not least is... Um, the importance of uh, training your dog. Why is training important? And um, what, what are you doing when you're training a dog? You're doing again is you're building communications, right? Because a communication with another species. Because again, they don't understand words. They don't know what you want to do. So you need to associate something with, with, a, with a behavior so that they learn their word sit means to put my, my, my bottle on the ground, right? The down is to go all the way down with my elbows on the ground. So it's very important. So I do recommend um, training sit um, and down for every dog. Like I said, you know, uh, focus more on the down than on the seat, especially for um, for jumping dogs. But I do that for every dog. The other thing that I do is um, teaching touch. Touch is such an easy um, command to do. And basically, all you do is you have a treat in your hand. And you present your hand for the dog and they have to put their nose to your treat to get a treat and that's all you need to do teach them that this is very important because it's a practical way for you to make your dog move um, you know around with you and um one of my number one um uh, training is recall you know um a lot of people like to take dogs to areas where they can be off leash which i think is great if you have areas that are appropriate for dogs to be that but you are responsible for calling your back, your dog back to you, right? You can have them off leash, but you have to have voice control. When you call your dog, your dog is supposed to come back to you. But most of the times, what happens? So you have your old dog on the leash, and a dog is running towards you, and a person goes, and you go, hey, call your dog back. And the person says, oh, he's a nice dog. What comes to my mind is that doesn't have a recall, right? Because if she had a recall, she just could call the, the, back, the, the, the dog back to her. So the most important thing, so I have the rules for recall is you can only call the dog once and you say the name of the dog, you say, you know, um, um, you know, puppy, let's say, come. And then you don't say anything anymore. You can whistle, you can clap your hands, you can make, you know, kisses sounds, you can jump up and down. But you cannot repeat because if it repeats, you know, you, you say, Fido, come, come, come. He's going to wait for you to go, come, 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 come before he comes. So the trick is, Fido, come. Bo, 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 bo. He comes to you. What are you going to give it to him? Baby food. I said, like, why baby food? We like to train recall with baby food. You know baby food are? Those little jars in the supermarket that you give to kids. We, we recommend either chicken or beef because they don't have a lot of salt on them and they love it. So it's a very high value treat for them. And the reason we like to use that is because they learn to come to you, but also they associate that with baby food. So when you say come, it's like, ooh, baby food. So that increases the probability that your dog is going to come back to you. So you say, Fido, come, pop, 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 make sounds so that he comes to you. So the command is very clear. Then you offer them baby food. And this is a game that you should start playing inside of your house in a circle, like three, two or three people. If it's two people, one person calls, the other person calls, and then you increase the, the distance in front of them. Then 
next time you're going to be one person in the kitchen, the other person in the bedroom. You stretch the distance inside of your house. Then you go to the backyard and you practice that. Don't just practice this outside because now you're going to be competing with other distractions in the environment. So you have to have a solid recall in the house. Then you go outside with a long leash and you practice that with your dog for you to be able to have, you know, a solid recall with your dog. Um, and I think I'm done, unless, um, do we have yeah. any questions? So, hi, my name is Erin. I'm the marketing manager here at Tony LaRusso's Animal Rescue Foundation. We've had a few questions coming in, so I'm going to just be off screen, but I'm going to be um, sharing some of your questions that you've submitted already, but keep them coming if you have any more um, so that Anna can answer your training questions. So the okay. first one we have is from Sherry. She wants to know if she has a one and a half year old dog. She, her dog loves to chew on shoes. Mm. And she's wondering if she should get an adult Kong for her dog or what kind of chewing power, what kind of power chewer would, would her dog be if her dog loves to chew on shoes? Okay, first of all, what you need to do with any behavior when you want to modify them is to manage. Number one, Put shoes away. So or shoes cannot be part of this game, right? Do not allow them access to shoes because to shoes because you need to stop that behavior. So the type of the chewing that they do when they, they chew, you know, shoes is usually the ones that they can be satisfied with this kind of uh, of um, products because again they are putting on their on the on the back of their mouth and they are chewing on it. But both the, the these chewing toys in the Kong can be used to help dog calm down. Uh, and, and satisfy the need to chew on 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 do the to the, the satisfy the need to chew. So for an adult, so it depends. It, if your dog is just destroying shoes and nothing else, it doesn't go for wood or anything hard. Definitely the red one. So the the, the red one is the is the, the classical. So this is for moderate chewers. And if you go to Pet Food Express, they do have our products there. And I'm sure that um, they're the, the, their team have the expertise to help you uh, choose the appropriate toy for, for your dog. They will help you help you with the size and they'll help you with the type of rubber that your dogs, uh, that will be appropriate for your dog. So our next question is from someone who has a puppy and they're wondering if you have any, what fillers for you know, Kongs or food puzzles, do you recommend for a puppy when first introducing them to a Kong or a food puzzle? You know, and, um, and would it be different for a puppy versus an adult when you're first introducing these products? Okay. So um, it's very important that when you select like, something to, to offer to your dog that he likes, right? So that's the main thing. He needs to like what you're going to offer. So that's why I love to use their own food. Because um, first, you're going to use this as, as a way for them to eat. They are hungry and they want their food. So you can mix their food, their kibble, maybe with the chicken broth, maybe with wet food or with yogurt, banana. If a dog loves banana, just mash a little bit of banana, mix with the food and broth. But they need to like it. If they don't like banana and if you, you mix with the kibble, it's not going to like. So I, I I love to have what I call recreational Kongs. And if you go to Pet Food Express, you're also going to find there um, the products that Kong makes, you know, to, for you to fill the Kongs with, to, to, to stuff the Kong with. And those are good as well. But I like to, to stuff Kongs with the things that my dogs love. For example, my daughter, she does not like bananas. So if you try, you know, put some mashed banana for her, she's just not gonna want that, but she loves yogurt. And I do that, I use uh, canned pumpkin, sweet potato. I offer, I mix that with their kibo and they like. So the most important thing, especially if you're introducing, make sure that you make it easy, right? That you not just pack this comb too hard, just put the food loose in, in the beginning, put some treats mixed with the kibo, that's gonna help as well. And then choose something wet that your dog really likes. You can put a little bit of baby food, but baby food is very rich. So you can use a little bit for that to entice your dog to start, but I would not recommend giving cones, you know, too frequently with a baby food or even peanut butter. Great, thank you. So another question came in, they have a rescue dog that likely would have been euthanized if they had not rescued him because he has what is described as stranger danger. He has an intense fear of strangers and will try to bite if they approach. How this um, 
viewer is asking, how can I redirect him? Or if he redirects him is and then rewards a sit, is that rewarding the bad behavior? Okay. So they don't want to reward the bad behavior, but they definitely want to make sure that their dog isn't trying to go after strangers. Okay. What do you recommend about how to correct a, a, an extreme behavior like that? Okay, so um, first of all, again, is management, um, making sure that you do not have a person approaching a dog. The number one reason is that this is fear, right? So he's fearful of that 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 person. There's fear of something. So first you need to keep this person away. Never to approach your dog. If you can manage it, that will happen. And do not worry about reinforcing any behavior because we are talking about emotion. We are not talking, we're talking about how they feel. So what you need to do here it is, is feed your dog, feed your dog because they need to build this positive association with the strangers. So when we work with what I mentioned to you here, counter conditioning, which is, you know, one thing predicts that another thing is going to happen and this develops a, a anticipatory response to them. So they feel that this becomes this and then the, suddenly the thing that they're seeing, the person becomes a hot dog or a dog becomes a hot dog for them because they predict that that's what's going to happen. But the most important thing when you're talking about you know, um, dogs barking at people or, or dogs barking at other dogs. It's since it's all related to being afraid or fear is an emotion. You need to desensitize. What does that mean? You need to give them a distance, right? You need to be away from the person so that he feels here and the person is like 10 feet away. I'm okay. I feel okay. Now you can counter condition it. You can give them something good. You don't want to give something you know, uh, to the dog when he's feeling fear, they might, he might not even take take the tweets from you, right? Because I always know I don't want anything. I'm afraid of this person. Right? He has a feeling there. You're not going to be able to do. It. He doesn't take any tweets. That's mostly what happened to the dog. So give the distance. Show people at a distance. You know, in your house, that the person's across the street. So, oh, a nice person there. Then give the treat. Look at the person and you give the treat. So now, yes, now you are building, you know, this positive emotional response to a stranger or something. But you do have to have a distance. To do that so uh, by 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 like like Ari mentioned to me that you say you know the strangers here and you're asking your dog to sit he might even perform that behavior for you he might take a treat for you but might be too much you know he might not feel he might might feel you know stress about that so you're not gonna have the better result that you could have if you give distance it's like if a person is afraid of uh, snakes or you know I know I know bats you know, and I was, oh, look, I have a bat here. I want to show you. It's like, oh, keep her over there. You know, and I might talk, right? You don't say, no, it's okay. I'm going to give you a few of them for you to feel better. You're only going to get, you know, more fearful of bats and you're going to hate the person as well, right? You don't want to see the person in front of you. So it's the same with dogs. You need to provide, make them feel comfortable. So distance is very important, you know, provide distance to them. So if you know that your dog's fear of, of people in general, just make sure that you give them distance and then you, you, you do the counter condition. You provide them with something delicious for them to build this positive association. Great. Um, so another question that we got is, what do you recommend using as, do you recommend using clickers or do you recommend using voice cues when training dogs? Okay. I uh, personally um, love clickers. And I think that if you give a clicker an opportunity, you might get addicted to it because it's not just um, um, something that, you know, trainers train to do. It's, it's, it's based in science that when a dogs are trained with clickers, that they retain that information for longer because it's a very simple a way of um, giving that information to the dog. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to do, right? A lot of people like to use yes. The issue I have with yes is that you use yes to tell your dog to do something. Yes, you made a sit or yes, do your dog. But then you also use yes in your house. Oh yes, I'm going. Yeah, sure, you can do that. The dog might get confused, you know. Am I doing something here that's good too, that's gonna get a treat, right? So that's why when, um, you know, police, uh, the military, when they train dogs, they train in a different language. So the dog doesn't even hear those words. So I'm not against creating a word you can. I just make sure that you never use that word. So I, I would go for a different language if you want to use a word. But a clicker um, is a very fast and very effective way of telling a dog that this is what I want to do and be able to reward right away. 
this is what I want to do and create a reward. And uh, and they and, and if you see a, a click a dog train, what happens with them is that you know they learn how to learn. They learn that you know they they start you know giving you behaviors for you to reinforce them because they like the game. It's a fun game to have. So yes, I love clicker training, and that's what we do here at Arc. Great. Um, another question we got is. Someone is wondering, how, what's the best way to try to train a dog to stop barking when the when there's knocking at the door? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Well, there are several ways uh, of uh, of doing this, but um, one way um, that I like to recommend, you know, is um, by consequences. So your dog, you know, somebody comes to the, the house, he barks. You tell the dog, um, thank you for him to stop or you can say enough. You choose what to do. So the dog has to have a chance to stop the behavior they're doing, right? So they are woo, 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 barking and they say, thank you. And then he's like, woo, woo, barking. And he say, too bad. And you give a dog a timeout, just like with kids, right? So when if you, your kids ask you, can we watch TV to have friends over? Sure. And great, because I'm gonna get, you know, some work done here. So you're right there. And then the kids start, you know, running around screaming. You go to the living room, you turn off the TV and they stop. Right, stops the behavior. You want to watch the TV? You have to sit down. So the same with dogs. The timeout works with dogs as well. But you have to give a chance for the dog to do the behavior and have a chance to choose not to do it. So ow, 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 thank you. Ow, ow, too bad. You put them in a bathroom. You know, I say bathroom because usually you have a smaller bathroom. You know, next to, for a few seconds. You don't leave the dog not even for a minute because. What he wants is him to, to repeat the behavior. Let him come out and he's going to straight to barking. Whoa, whoa, thank you. Whoa, whoa, too bad. He goes to the bathroom. So it's a timeout, a few seconds to let them out. So he comes out and he doesn't bark. Good dog. And then he reward that. I also saw something uh, very interesting from a, a trainer that, that I follow that, um, that I like to recommend. So and it's out of context. I like this because it's out of context. She has four dogs. So for people that have more than one dog in the house, and what happened is that every time anybody comes to the door, they all went to the door and bark, 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 bark. So what she do, did is this. She sat down in front of a TV and out of the room, nothing's happened. She goes, cookie. And then she ran to the back of the house where she wanted them to go when people come to the door. She went there. She gave them treats. Everybody ate. It was like very excited. Whoa, that was excellent. You know, a shower of, uh, uh, of hot dogs. And then, okay. I'm done. And then she walked away. And everybody, nothing else is happening? No. And then that's it. The next day she was in the kitchen. Nothing was happening. She's like, cookie. And then she went to, to the same place and the same thing happened. So she did that out of context before, right? Before everything happened. Guess what? When somebody came in the door and they, they start to bark, boo, and they're like, oh, I think we're going to go there. And they just went by themselves. And she told the twins, she closed the door. She was able to go there. So I also like this one. Great. Um, Amanda wants to know, I keep hearing a lot about snuffle mats or snuffle toys and foraging for dogs. Is that really good for them? Should I be doing that with my dog? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love those you know, snuffle mats that they get to look for their food. It's the same as these type of toys, right? It's the toys that provide them with an opportunity to work for their food. Dogs prefer to eat, you know, to work for their food. It's called counter counter freeloading they once they know that they can work for their food they prefer to work for the food than finding the food you know um, available for free for them so it's, it's a it's a it's something that's innate to them they are bored with that and you can do that with snapple and toys you can even do that in a backyard you know my little daughter when she was um eight weeks old that's when i got her um is she oh my god she was really spicy she she wanted to be with me she wanted to do things i would get her kibo and in my backyard you know had grass had stones, a lot of things going on. I just go, go, go find it. And let's just spend the time, you know, sniffing around trying to find it. And you can teach the dog that. Teach the dog to find it. Very simple. Get the food, you throw it here and say, find it. And they find, oh, okay, over there, find it. Teach them very close to you to look for their food. Then use this game outside. You take the food and you throw it on the ground, say, go find it. And the dog go find it. Over here, and the dog go find it. And then you can, you know, increase the area where you're doing that and do like I do. Shoot, you know, throw the tricks and then go the kibble and then they can look for their food. They prefer to work their food. They have the food available on a dish. That goes, you know, counter their nature to get food available for free for them. Great. So that was all the questions that we had today that came in so far. But if you think of anything else, 
Um, please definitely reach out to us at Tony LaRusso's Animal Rescue Foundation, where our website is earthlife.org. We have lots of helpful training articles, and there's also a way to reach out for private consultations with Anna if you want more help with a behavior that your dog is dealing with. Um, oh, I'm just getting maybe one more, and one more question. Um, and then we'll, and then we'll wrap it up, but definitely reach out to us here at Tony Larissa's Animal Rescue Foundation. We'd love to work with you to help um, you with your dog's behaviors. Um, so the last question, Anna, is my dog is not really food motivated. Do you, is there anything else I can do to motivate them during training or that you recommend? Okay. So, you know, food is important because, you know, food is a primary resource. Food is what dogs work for, right? You cannot have the dog do something for you and then pay them a hundred dollars. You know what they're going to do with this hundred dollars, right? So for them, the important thing for them is food. So when I have dogs that are not motivated for food, I like to, to, um, uh, recommend not feeding your dog. For example, when they when the adopters come here, you know, pet parents come here for a private consultation, first thing I tell them is like, do not feed your dog, right? Bring them hungry because they don't know me and I need them to provide these behaviors that I'm going to ask them to do. So they have to have, you know, an empty stomach and I have cheese, I'm going to have chickens, I'm going to uh, uh, hot dogs, I'm going to have the things that they wanted to have for me so I'll be able to work for them. So if you have a dog that's not motivated, I would try not giving the breakfast maybe offer lunch so that you can train this dog or even, even later if you want. Another thing is that you can also use a ball or a duck toy for, to reinforce your dog. So there are different ways for you to reinforce a behavior, not just food, but food is very powerful. Treats is very powerful. And I do recommend you trying to use that because it's easier for you um, and it's gonna be uh, an, an effective way for you to get them to do something that you really want. So not to say that you cannot play tag with your dog and then have a ball and you want to do this, I'm going to throw a ball. So for dogs um, um, in, a, in our privacy, I talk about creating like a pyramid, you know, from the bottom to top, what are the important um, foods for your dog? So then, you know, for example, kibble and then, you know, treats that you can buy uh, at a Pet Food Express. Um, 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 let's say cheese and then chicken, hot dogs, right? So then you go up to the scale and the top one is the one that's really, really high value for your dog. Then, you know, like if you are training your dog at home where there are not much distractions, you can even train your dog with kibble, right? But if you want to go outside, so if you know that your dog is reactive with other dogs, right? If you know that dog's going to bark at people, you cannot just bring kibbles. You're going to go, oh, who wants that, right? You bring hot dogs, you bring che chicken, maybe cheese. With then, then it's like, oh, wow, what was that? Then he's motivated to work for you because it's, it's, it's a primary reinforcement. It's something that they, they like to, to, to have it and, and it's easy to use. Not to say that you cannot use, you know, other reinforcement like playing or petting, but that might not be, you know, um, useful at all the times uh, with your dog. So if your dog's not good motivated, just, you know, get him hungry. And it's okay, you know, sometimes you have to keep your dog from eating if they have to do a blood test. Or, you know, like me, when I competed with my dog in, in a professional competition, I, I fed her everything I could, right? Chicken, boiled egg, whatever she loved because she needed to work with me. When I was back home, she didn't want to have food anymore. It's like, oh, now I'm going to wait. I said, you wait, no breakfast, try lunch, no wait. And the dinner time, I already asked, then she eats. So it's okay for you to do that so that you can have the benefit of having, you know, them motivated to work for you. And, you know, Erin mentioned that, you know, you can contact us here, you know, our, our website is uh, our flight, uh, at, at uh, .org and you can contact us there. Um, we do have private consultations. We also have puppy socials and that's very important. I just want to mention this to you because we have puppy socials on Wednesdays here and some of the information is in our website. Um, please do bring your puppies to socialize because that's very important. That's a very important um, phase of, of their lives. That's when they learn and everything that they learn here is going to reflect for the rest of their lives. So I do recommend coming for our puppy socials and um, getting to know your dogs. I'm there to help you answer your questions if you have. Thank you so much and thank you for the time to be here. I was very happy to be here.